in terms of my background, I, I come from New Zealand originally. Uh, I have uh, I trained in, in medicine. I specialized in general surgery. Uh, my wife and I worked with in healthcare mission in East Africa, and then we came to the UK back in 1989. We spent a couple of years at All Nations Christian College, which had 170 students from 40 countries doing cross-cultural mission. The Lord called me out of clinical medicine at that point, and I then worked for 27 years with the Christian Medical Association Fellowship in the UK, which brings together about 5,000 doctors, all Christians. And then uh, for the last four years, I've been with the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists in over 100 countries worldwide. We've got 84 affiliated national movements, and our aim is to, to start and to strengthen national associations of Christian doctors and dentists. So that's uh, wh where we're at. Now, we've got three hours together today, and uh, we've got a massive topic, and we're not going to be able to do much more than look at, uh, at general principles, but I hope it will give you a good uh, taster. So uh, let's first of all think about uh, the, the background. Let's take a step back and look at the history of Europe over the last uh, three centuries or so and see the way in which it's developed. Three books that are really helpful, I think, in this area. Love Thy Body, Nancy Piercy is, is probably one of the leading uh, evangelical academics writing on issues of bioethics in, in, um, in the US today. And uh, this is a fantastic book. It, it shows how a misunderstanding of the theology of the body, what the Bible teaches about the body, is behind so much of the change that we see in terms of life ethics and sexuality and so on. Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self traces the development, uh, or, or really the, the, uh, the fall of Europe across the last three centuries away from a Christian worldview and shows why we're in the situation we are at the moment with issues like transgender and LGBT. And he's got a much smaller cut down version of that book that you can buy as well. And then The Global Sexual Revolution uh, by Gabriel Kuby. This is a Catholic perspective uh, on much the same material that Carl Truman's writing about uh, on the history of Europe. Um, but uh, she's Catholic, but she's got a very strong biblical grounding as well. And you'll find that book very helpful in terms of understanding the trends behind what we see. But essentially what we're seeing in Europe is, is a transition from a time three or four centuries ago where most people had a theistic worldview to one in which atheism is now the prominent worldview. So uh, people in Europe generally used to believe, as we do now, that, that there's God, an all-powerful creator and sustainer of the universe, that he's made us for a relationship with himself, that morality is what's revealed in the person of Christ and in, in the scriptures and is in line with God's character that death is not the end, but it leads to judgment and one of two destinations, heaven or hell, that human beings are made to worship God and to glorify him. And the truth is revealed by God uh, through the prophets, through the scriptures and the person of, of Christ. And uh, although not all people in Europe a few centuries ago were, were born again, they had predominantly a theistic worldview. So they had this kind of way of thinking about it. And then we've seen... Uh, massive changes and, and the three probably most important agents in that change and shift to atheism were, first of all, the Enlightenment movement towards the end of the 18th century. And uh, what, what the Enlightenment did was it replaced divine revelation through the scriptures with human reason as the source of morality and truth. And then uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Darwin's theory of evolution made atheism uh, intellectually respectable because it gave an alternative view for origins. And so people could uh, remain rational and yet no longer believe in a creator God. And then the third thing that happened is that in the early part of the 19th century, higher criticism uh, and its attack on the New Testament documents undermined faith in the Bible as a source of truth and, and uh, morality and, and uh, revelation. So th these three things acting together put us in a situation different in every country across Europe where increasingly there was a move from theism to, 
to atheism, this view that God doesn't exist, moral good is what we decide, that uh, death is the end, there's no life after death, human beings are just higher animals, they're just clever monkeys, they're just the product of matter, chance and time in a godless universe, and, and that truth, because there's no God, there's no revelation, and so the only way we can discover truth is through our five senses, use, uh, and uh, through observation of the world in which we live, the scientific method, uh, and so on, or derive it from some ide ideology, as is usually the case. Now, if we, if we take uh, Richard Dawkins, the biologist, uh, as simply an example of this change of thinking, he's a, a, a very extreme example, I think, but his view would be that biological complexity that we see today in the, in the animal world and in humanity is uh, entirely explained by evolution, descent with modification, uh, natural selection, gene mutation, genetic drift, that's uh, what accounts for it all. So that the complex biological systems that we see in ourselves and animals, it's all chance and time. The Bible is unreliable, it's inaccurate, and uh, the Christian God, more than that, is immoral. He's a, a, a genocidal, pestilential, homophobic uh, being who, who doesn't exist, but he's been invented by Christians in order to control people and push uh, an ideology. And um, when I talk about the politicization of Darwinism, what I mean is that the, the, the fundamental belief behind uh, evolution, of course, is that um, it's all about the survival of the fittest. And the politicization of Darwinism means that the non-survival of the weakest becomes not just a biological fact, if you like, but actually a public duty as well. In other words, that we have uh, a, a duty to be able to ensure that the gene pool remains strong and that the fit survive and, and the weaker members uh, do, do not. And uh, you, I, mean, I think you can put up, up a very good case to say that actually what, what happened un under Nazi Germany's regime was the politicization of Darwinism in the sense that, uh, that there was a deliberate attempt to ensure that the weakest did not survive. And so you have this view, the secular or materialist worldview, that human beings are just one of many species on the planet. They're no more important than any other, that um, many human beings are of less value than higher animals like dolphins and chimpanzees, and that we, we judge the value of human life upon the quality it has, and particularly our capacity for interaction, communication, rationality, and so on. And, and what follows from that is that, that some human lives are worthy of greater respect than others, and, and the idea that the weak uh, should be sacrificed for the strong. And, and this is, this is in, in contrast to the Christian worldview that every human being is made in God's image, incredibly precious, worthy of respect, of protection, of empathy, and uh, of wonder, and, and uh, it needs to be honored that every human being uh, is is uh, precious, made in the image of God. And that therefore the strong have a duty to make sacrifices for the weak. We think of Christ who, although he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, Philippians 2, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant. Uh, or as Paul says in Romans, while we were weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So the whole Christian ethic is about the strong serving the weak uh, giving themselves sacrificially for the weak, walking in the footsteps of Christ, who was the, the strong creator and sustainer of the universe, yet gave himself for us. And so I'm contrasting these two different uh, worldviews, which have been very influential. Now, uh, Binding and Hock were, were two uh, writers at the beginning of the 20th century, German, and they uh, produced a book called Permitting the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Life, in which they coined the idea that there was such a thing as human lives that were not worthy of respect. And uh, it was these guys writing in the 1920s who provided the intellectual basis for what followed in the 1930s and 40s in Germany with the, the Holocaust and what ended in Auschwitz, Treblinka and Belsen and places like that actually had far subtler beginnings in nursing homes, mental hospitals and so on. What happened with the Jews was really an end stage that began with children who were profoundly handicapped and elderly people with dementia uh, and, and so on. And so um, 
following on from this this different way of thinking about humanity, we get Watson and Crick, the uh, the founders of, or, or the discoverers of the molecular structure of DNA, who both of them were supported infanticide and said that that human beings should not be counted as fully human until a few days after birth, when a number of tests could be done to find out, uh, you know, whether they had uh, particular forms of genetic diseases uh, or whatever. And so, uh, and more modern. Uh, bioethicists like Peter Singer, who's from Australia but now in, in, in the US, uh, says that the Christian approach uh, to bioethics is speciesist because it elevates human beings above other animals and in fact you know, we're not any different from uh, other animals. And so uh, Peter Singer is a strong supporter of animal rights but he's also a strong supporter of abortion, of euthanasia, and other things, and many others have followed in his footsteps. And, and the, the lesson from it is that once you start treating uh, animals like humans, then it's not long before you start treating humans like animals. And so what, what I'm wanting you to, to appreciate here is that the change in worldview from theism to atheism in Europe had big consequences for the way that people thought about human beings, and that had consequences in the way that we treat Human beings. We've seen extreme examples, in, you know, in in the um, the Gulag and in Nazi Germany. But but the same kind of thinking is still very prevalent today. And uh, of course, in any culture, the direction or trajectory of that culture is driven by the predominant worldview in that in that uh, cultural setting. And so, if you live in a, in, a, in a country where the predominant worldview is Islamic, for example, it will have profound effects on what we call the mountains of culture in the way that uh, education is you know, it taught and what's taught in the schools and universities, uh, what's depicted in art and entertainment, what, what government does in terms of the laws it frames, what happens in families, what religion is dominant, uh, and the direction of business and media as well. So if you're living in a, in a culture where the predominant worldview is atheism, then that will affect and drive all of these different uh, mountains. And I'd put it to you that we're living in a, a time now where, in Europe where we're living in what is really an end stage culture, a disintegrating culture which has lost its Christian roots uh, and could well be described by Paul's description of the, uh, the people in Romans chapter one where he said, We've exchanged God for idols, and then we've exchanged truth for lies, and then we've exchanged natural for unnatural. In other words, we've exchanged a moral position for an immoral position. And you remember how that all ends, you know, God, God has given these people up. But I think this is the kind of culture that we're living in. It's uh, incredibly sophisticated technologically, but in terms of morality, it's not much different from what's described in Romans 1 or, or the, um, what, what we see in, in uh, Canaanite or Amorite culture in the, Old, in the Old Testament. And remember that the Amorites were the people that, um, that Israel drove out of Canaan when they, when they arrived there on the east and west sides of the, of the Jordan. And there were three key markers of Amorite or Canaanite culture. The first one was idolatry. So they, they worshiped gods other than the one true God. The second thing was sexual immorality, which followed inevitably from that. And then the third mar marker was the shedding of innocent blood, child or human sacrifice that was uh, a part of that. And uh, it, uh, what I put it to you is that we're living in a, in a society which is incredibly sophisticated technologically, but actually uh, flagrantly idolatrous, because we don't worship God, but other idols, particularly material things, that uh, or autonomy or whatever, that there's sexual immorality, which is not only accepted but but approved, and the Christian worldview is seen as repressive and uh, and damaging, and then the shedding of innocent blood, particularly in terms of abortion happening uh, before birth, but also the push for the legalization of of euthanasia, and we'll unpack that as we go forward. You want to see a great uh, analysis of Western culture from a non-Christian uh, academic 
uh, look at Camille Parlier's video. If you, if you go to Google and put in Camille Parlier, that's how it's spelt uh, along the bottom there, Camille Parlier transgender, put that into Google and you'll bring up a, a 10 minute video where this non-Christian academic describes how she believes the West is uh, a, a, uh, an end stage culture approaching collapse and that the, the transgender revolution is a major marker of that, uh, of that trajectory at the moment. Um, so let me just say a little bit about transgender. We, we'll get into this later, but a couple of the great books on this. I mentioned Kubi's Global Sexual Revolution. The Madness of Crowds is, is another great book written by a non-Christian, Douglas Murray, particularly on, on the issues of race, uh, trans, LGBT, those three. And he, he does a very good cultural analysis of that. But what we've looked at the, the shift from theism to atheism in terms of, you remember the, um, the, 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 the theory of evolution, higher criticism and the enlightenment. But actually, if we want to understand transgender, then there are other cultural factors that have played into that. And I, I just deal with these very quickly uh, because of time, but, but there are three fundamental ideas that have led to the transgender revolution. The first one is, is radical feminism provided the backdrop for it. So um, uh, I call that cultural Marxism. Marxism is based on the idea that there is a, an oppressed minority, uh, oppressed by a, a powerful majority, and that the the oppressed minority can only find freedom by throwing off the yoke of the old one. Of course, communism, uh, which was the practical expression of Marxism, never works in practice because what all that happens is that the, the ones who, the revolutionaries, then become the new oppressors. But uh, cultural Marxism is, is this whole idea that there's an oppressed minority who are uh, beaten down by institutions and religion and, you know, powerful cultural forces and that they have to uh, throw off this uh, yoke. And so, um, and, and it's a question of who this oppressed minority is. And, and if you're trying to understand things like critical theory and, and, and cultural Marxism, think that this oppressed minority uh, started with, with, with uh, you know, the, the poor in, in what became communist societies, but, but it was actually feminists that replaced it. So women became this group, and then adding into them came the LGBT group, the transgender group, people from racial minorities. But it's the same kind of idea of, uh, you know, the same way of looking at the world. So the second uh, influence was Gnosticism, which is the, the worldview that that John is addressing in his first epistle, 1 John. And it's the idea that, that, um, that the real uh, us is what we feel inside rather than what we're told from outside through revelation. So if you want to know what truth is, you look inward to your feelings and, and thoughts. And this idea of this inner you that's really authentic is it resonates with the whole, particularly the whole LGBT revolution in terms of, you know, my identity is, is all related to the sexual attraction that I feel in its direction and strength. Or for the transgender thing as well, you know, if I feel I'm a, a woman trapped in a man's body or vice versa, then that's what I actually am and that I should be looking inwardly to my feelings. And uh, so Gnosticism. And then the third idea, queer theory, the idea that gender categories of, of male and female are just social constructions and they have no basis in, in biological science or, uh, or biology at all. But um, they're just things that, that um, are produced by social conditioning. So in other words, if we want to know whether we're male or female or somewhere in between, then we don't look at our, our genes and our hormones and our, our physical structures or whatever we look to what we feel like inside as the authenticator of, of that. And then uh, given 
narrative power in sitcoms, rom-coms, documentaries and films and so on, and, and testimonies, the freeing of the human spirit from, from shame. There's a, a, a very quick Cook's tour, but uh, the, the main thing I want you to take out of it is that we've shifted in Europe from, athe from theism to atheism as the dominant worldview. That was driven first by the Enlightenment, the theory of evolution and higher criticism, and that more recently these other factors, radical feminism, cultural Marxism, Gnosticism, have played into the shift that we're, that we're seeing. Um, Judith Butler, who was really the intellect behind the transgender revolution, most people have never heard of her, that her book, Gender Trouble, really laid the intellectual framework for what is now um, a, a huge movement across the world. The psalmist in Psalm 11 talks about the foundations being destroyed and, uh, and asks the question, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And uh, what I put to you is that the foundations that have been destroyed in Europe over the last three or four centuries or so uh, have been the foundations that we see in, in Genesis, which tell us about the true nature of of uh, morality, but which people no longer believe anymore. So firstly, the theism, the idea that there is a God who created us and to whom we're accountable, that foundation is, is gone. That human beings are made in God's image for a special relationship with God, that foundation has gone. That sexuality is binary. The Bible's unashamedly binary. He made them in his image, male and female. There are two sexes. That idea is gone. It's a, a blend and trend now between them. Stewardship, the idea that God's given us responsibility to act morally in this world and look after the world. Uh, uh, marriage, one man, one woman for life uh, as, the, as the basis of strong societies, child rearing, intimacy, uh, fam, uh, mental health and so on. That's gone as a, a foundation. And then the idea of the sanctity of life, that every human being is precious, and worthy of respect and that we should never take the life of an innocent human being, that's gone as well. So we're living at a time uh, that I'd argue is an end stage culture and, and a, at a time of destroyed uh, foundations. So we've looked at the changes in Western culture. We've looked at some of the consequences of that change of worldview, but now let's just think about our uh, biblical foundations. And uh, let's go right back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27 where it says that human beings are made in the image of God. And it's this idea of being made in the image of God and therefore special and worthy of protection that is really the origin of the whole idea of human rights in Western culture. That's where it came from. How do you get human rights from evolution? It's very difficult to do it. So we've got Michelangelo's creation picture up here. And this this uh, strange looking fellow on the, on the right is a a British doctor called Thomas Sydenham, who lived back in the 17th century, was a, a strong Puritan and Bible-believing Christian. And he used to tell all his students, so a brilliant doctor whose name's associated with many treatments and conditions, but he used to tell his students, human beings, first day at medical school, and Sydenham says to you, never forget that human beings are incredibly precious for two reasons. First of all, every human being is made in the image of God and worthy of respect and protection. But secondly, because God himself became a human being in the person of Christ. And in so doing, he gave the human race uh, a unique nobility. God didn't become any other kind of animal. So that's the idea of human dignity, the image of God. And the image of God is linked with protection in Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds human blood this is just after the flood narrative. By humans shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made mankind. So the, the sixth commandment of the, pen, of the Decalogue, of the Ten Commandments, which, which is you shall not kill, or translated you, you shall not murder, because it's really based, uh, what it really means is you shall not take the life of an innocent human being. That's what it, what it means intentionally. Um, it's... It's based on this idea, the Sixth Commandment had its root in Genesis 9, 6. Because human beings have made the image of God, you cannot kill them, even if they ask to be uh, killed. And so this was the 
the origin of the uh, idea of the sanctity of life if we look at the passages in the Old Testament which explain what the Sixth Commandment means, we see that it's talking about the intentional killing of an innocent human being. So it, it uh, makes a distinction from unintentional killing or manslaughter and from killing in the context of capital punishment, holy war, self-defense, and, and so on of supposedly guilty human beings. So that's what the Sixth Commandment uh, means in both, and I've, I've listed there on that slide, which we haven't got time to look at, the, the passages which explain that actually you shall not kill means don't intentionally take the life of an innocent human being. All the way through Scripture, there is a, a universal and consistent prohibition on shedding innocent blood, it's called. Uh, we see it in the in the um, in the Pentateuch and the prophetic literature and the in the Psalms, uh, uh, the wisdom literature and so on, so on. But this is something that not many Christians know, because not many Christians read um, Kings and Chronicles and so on. But you remember the story how Israel went into exile in Babylon, and the prophet said this is going to happen, and it's it's because uh, of their refusal to repent. But actually, in Second Kings, the, the, the worst of all the kings was a chap called Manasseh who was involved in all sorts of bad practices, but particularly the shedding of innocent blood. And what, what uh, the scripture says in Second Kings, these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command. I mean, by these things, the exile happened to Judah in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. And so the exile is directly linked to this idea of shedding innocent blood. So uh, I, I give you now just a, 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 um, an approach, uh, a Christ-like approach for thinking about ethical issues. So the question we're asking is, how do we apply the principles of scripture to contemporary bioethical issues today? Because you can't go to a concordance or Bible gateway and look up IVF or abortion or transgender or um, or euthanasia. You, you, the words are not there in the Bible. Does that mean that God has nothing to say about any of these things? Uh, no, because there are principles in the Bible that we can apply to thinking about these issues. So I'm just going to give you these, these four uh, principles now. So the first of all is um, having the mind of Christ. And uh, that means having a, a Christian worldview, uh, a view of the world that we're going from, that, that we're seeing a great big story that begins with creation, we're made in the image of God, and then the fall, we've rejected God, and that's led to a breakdown of relationships and all sorts of calamities in the planet, disease, disasters, and so on. That God's intervened in the world to bring redemption primarily through Christ's death and resurrection, by which uh, we can gain forgiveness through repentance and faith and look forward to a life in a new heaven and a new earth. But also God's brought through his, through common grace, lots of good things, science and technology and, and all, all the big gifts that he's given us to make our lives better as well in a fallen world. And that we look forward to our future hope of being resurrected with new bodies like Christ's resurrected body in a new creation. So that's uh, having a Christ-like mind. Uh, the second one, Christ-like obedience. So there are moral principles in Scripture. So we've talked about human dignity already, um, but uh, the complementarity of the sexes, the idea that, that God made us male and female. Of course, in a fallen world, that's become distorted, but that was his intention. Stewardship and science that he's given us the authority and responsibility to understand how the work, work, world works, to develop technologies which can help serve our fellow beings. It's, it's something of, of his desire for us. The sanctity of life, which is you don't kill an innocent human being. Marital purity, the idea that sex is God's gift only for the context of marriage, one man, one woman for life. That is the, the uh, context. Children are a gift, so not there to ex 
to be exploited, not there to meet our desires, but entrusted by God to us to care for them. They're not uh, objects, they are uh, subjects. Confidentiality, the idea that you should not use information about people against them or to harm them in some way. I think that's got big things to say about the search and destroy technology whereby you do genetic tests on people without their knowledge, particularly if they're very young, and then you make decisions about their lives as a result of that to harm them. Uh, our God is a God of justice and equity. All human beings are made in the image of God. And then this idea that the end does not justify the means. In other words, because you've got a good intention, it doesn't mean you can use any means to produce it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So you might say, um, let's think about Vietnam in the, or, or let's think about Cambodia, Kampuchea in the time of, of Pol Pot. And um, uh, Pol Pot had the intention of eradicating uh, disability. And we'd say, well, you know, that'd be a great thing if we could, we, we could, uh, ensure that there was no disability in the world. But the, the way he did it was by killing disabled people. Well, that's, that's using bad means to achieve a, a good end. So we can't let the end justify the means. Uh, life before birth. Um, the, you can't go to a passage in Scripture which says, um, do you want to know when life begins and, and when we should treat people with absolute respect? Well, it's the time of fertilization. Thus says the Lord. There's not a verse saying something like that. But what we do see is over 60 biblical references to conception. The word, the concept is really important and lots of references, too many to look at, to life before birth. You, you think of Isaiah and Jeremiah being told that God had chosen them before they were born or you think of uh, Jacob and Esau fighting in the womb or you think of the, the baby having the, the red string uh, tied around its hand and so on, and then being born in, in opposite order in Christ's genealogy, the twins. And uh, then uh, with Jesus, we have, we have uh, Elizabeth prophesying over Jesus in, in the first chapters of the Gospels when we know Jesus was in his first months because she was pregnant with John the Baptist and he was six months older than, than Jesus. We can work, work that out. And the Bible also talks about Jesus becoming flesh uh, and uses the, the aorist form of the past tense for that, which refers to an event that happens not over a period of time, but in a moment of, of time. And uh, if Jesus was, became flesh in a moment of time, then, of course, because he's made in every way like us, we must also as well. So these are all... I think very strong uh, arguments for the idea that human life begins at fertilization because that's when a unique new human being comes into existence. And the only difference between us and, a, and the early human embryo is nutrition and time. There's nothing else that's added there. We are complete human beings from the beginning. And uh, these are important because the way you think about human embryos, of course, has huge repercussions for what you think about certain forms of contraception, for artificial uh, reproduction techniques that involve the freezing of embryos or the destruction of them or experimentation upon them, or, or uh, prenatal testing techniques which involve uh, selecting and destroying embryos. This is something we could come back to over coffee or in, in, in discussion. But... Um, it, it, it's the fundamental question is, is an e a human embryo a human being or not? And should it be shown the same respect as any other human being at any stage of life? And I'd argue that the, 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 the witness of Scripture is, is definitely very strongly in that direction. In other words, an embryo isn't a potential human being. It's a human being with potential. There's a huge difference a very young human being, and that we should not be discriminating against human beings on the basis of any biological characteristics they may have, including their age. We can't exploit old people, we shouldn't exploit young people as well. Christ-like character is the third one. 
and we're called to be imitators of God, imitators of Christ to show the fruit of the Spirit. And the importance of this is that we're, we're called to be like Christ in our dealings with other people. Uh, and Christ, who, as you remember, emptied himself and gave himself uh, as the strong gave, made sacrifices for the weak, that we're called to walk in the same footsteps to show the fruit of the, the Spirit. And it requires a, a Christ-like character in order to make good moral decisions as well. And then the final one is Christ-like cross-bearing. Um, the illustration here, John 8, is the woman caught in adultery. And you remember they, they brought her before Christ and uh, they said, this woman's caught in the act of adultery. What the, the scriptures say we should stone her to death. What do you say? And of course, they were hypocritical because if she was caught in the act, okay, so the man must have been there as well because she was caught in the act and they only brought the woman. So we see they were discriminating against women to start with and misapplying the law. But Jesus had a choice. You know, does he, does he just let this woman off and therefore say morality isn't important? Or does he um, uh, just you know, uh, stone her to death and then say mercy isn't important? And, and Christ brought both holiness and mercy together. We talk about the cross being where wrath and mercy meet. And, and what Jesus did was he, he didn't condemn and he didn't say it wasn't important. He, he called her to repentance, said, go and sin no more. And then he went to the cross to die for her and all of us as well. We don't know if that woman ever became a Christian believer, but we know that Christ's death on the cross was sufficient to save her. And so uh, what I'm talking about here is there's a third way. So the first way is the way of condemnation. The second way is the, the, the way of saying oh, morality is not important. The third way is the costly way of the, of the cross. And uh, if, you, if you think about uh, some of these issues, you think about abortion, for example, you can, on the one hand, condemn women who find themselves with unplanned pregnancies. On the other, you can say, uh, or at least on one, one hand, you can say, you know, force them to bring up a child that they've not got the means of doing, uh, no support from a husband or male figure. Uh, they might not have the money to do it. You can force them to do that. Uh, on the other hand, you can say, oh, you know, uh, that's nothing in the womb. You can have an abortion. It's, it's free. But actually, there's a third way, which is costly, which says on the one hand, we must not take innocent human life, but also says that women with unplanned pregnancies need all kinds of support and help, whether they decide to keep the babies or not. So it's a costly third way, like Jesus's third way of going to the cross was costly because it involves expending our time and effort and energy. In the same way, you might say, either we give this person dying with cancer a, a lethal injection, or we make them suffer in terrible pain. It seems like there's a, no, there's a third way, which is good palliative care, caring for them as Christ himself would, giving them the symptom relief and support that they, they need. So uh, what does it mean to carry the cross? What I'm saying is that, is that one aspect of carrying the cross is that we are called as, as God's people to provide compassionate solutions for situations where the world sees just euthanasia and abortion as the only solution. But we're also, I believe, in, in carrying the cross, called to stand up for Christian values in a world that's increasingly rejecting them, which means being a voice for those who have no voice and seeking to speak for them, for their protection, and also to ensure that there are laws and statute books of our countries which protect innocent people from exploitation uh, and, and abuse. 